1.45 on a Saturday afternoon. The Molyneux dressing room waits in anticipation of the arrival of the heroes who will don the gold and black strip of Wolverhampton Wanderers. The number nine shirt will slip over the muscular frame of a man who is now a folk legend to the thousands of adoring fans who chant his name from the terraces of the famous old ground. A ground that has seen so many players who are rightly regarded as greats. Mullen, Hancocks, Richards, Wright, names that conjure up the glory of successful Wolves sides. When this young man arrived at Molyneux in 1986, Wolves were very far from glory. But he, more than anyone, has helped to rebuild Wolves, taking them back to the brink of the first division and establishing himself as one of the greats. Stephen George Bull, born March the 28th, 1965, at 153 Leebrook Road, Wensbury, in the West Midlands, the third of six children and the eldest of two sons. When he was three years old, the Bull family moved to Tipton in the heart of the black country, and it was here at number two South Road that the young Bull grew up. His first football experiences were gained on the traffic island that serves as Wembley for the youngsters of South Road little realising that one day this would lead to his stepping out onto the genuine verdant turf of Wembley itself, representing his country at international level and playing alongside modern-day footballing heroes like Gary Lineker, Paul Gascoigne, Brian Robson and Peter Shilton. Although never a top scorer academically, Physical education was always high on the list of priorities for Steve Bull throughout his school career, which began at Ocker Hill Infants and Wensbury Oak Junior Schools, before moving to the local Willingsworth High, where he played 
in his first organised matches. Every footballer always says, I've always wanted to play football for as long as I can remember. When you were at school, was there anything else that came into your mind that you thought, I'd like to have a go at that? Not really. As I say, I was, I was out there, as I say, an old ball, you know what I mean? Boots tied up to your, your shins, like whatever. I always wanted to be an all in all head footballer. Nothing else ever come, come across. Did you have these great games in the playgrounds at lunchtime where you <laughs> line up against the wall and pick sides? And well, you usually do. You, we used to do things like that. As I say, I used to go back go back home with ripped trousers, scraped shoes, new shoes, stuff like that, coat ripped. What well, I used to like to play in goal on the car park and everything, stuff like that. But uh, as you say, them days are gone now. What about school itself? Uh, were you a good studier or not? Not all that well. As you say, I always like, I, the only lesson I always wanted to do is PE. That was about the only one. The other ones, I just went through the exams as well. Thingy, uh, as I, I, I was a dumb person, but uh, I'm, I'm not that dumb. Where did you sit in the class? Were you the kind of guy that sat at the back in a row of four? Or? No, I like to sit at the front, but out the way. Oh, really? <laughs> that so was the about it. See you. That's it, yeah, they could see what I was doing, but they, you know, I, mean, I wasn't doing it too well. I said uh, a lot of people have credited you with the discovery of Steve Bull, and it's true that you were the first uh, man to really recognise his, his abilities, I think. Yeah, well, I was put it in mainly for tipping the team, really, you know. That was the idea of it in the first place, you know. But so, at the time, I don't think I was scouting for the Albion when he was 13, you know. I was friends with Wood Royal, being the Albion's chief scout, you know. But uh, she used to body players off the new team occasionally. But you saw you saw Steve playing in a, in a little game over the back of your house, I believe. Yeah, it was, it was match on uh, the Willings of the Schools, see. And uh, I noticed him... Uh, Beavering away, I was the smallest player on the pitch, playing up front. Got goal poaching ability. Having shots at goal, wasn't scared to miss, you know. And I thought, well, I'll ask him to play for me in two years' time when the game's ended. If he'll come and have a game over Tim Jutt, team. Got a good shot on him then, as well, as he yeah, young man. He could hit the ball, although he was frail. I think it's timing, really, with him. I think he's got good timing. Because yeah. he was physically a, a late developer, wasn't he? Oh, he was very small. Uh, even when I uh, had him in the youth team, he was, uh, he, although he started to grow, He's still got no uh, strength in him. I mean, he's very frail. He was getting taller. And, uh, but he could only score goals. A professional football career was a distant dream in July 1981 when Steve commenced work on a youth opportunity scheme with bed manufacturers Vono. From there, he worked for two other local firms, Wilner Building Supplies and Dom Holdings, now Unifix. At the same time, he was making a name for himself in amateur and Sunday league football. Alf, now, you had uh, Steve Ball playing for you on a Sunday morning. Some people will probably find it difficult to believe that uh, Steve Ball was playing Sunday morning football, but uh, you indeed had him there with your, your Sunday side. Yeah. What, what, uh, what made you want to sign him in the first place? Well, S Steve's exceptional pace was the, uh, the thing that first caught my eye with him. I mean, even now, I mean, people talk about his, his touch and that. I mean, I, I think people in general or know that he ain't a great footballer as such, but um, he's happy to for the game and uh, the sheer pace of the lad, yeah. you know. Now you, you used to go along and, and pick him up in the mornings to take, right. him, take him to play because he got no transport and that's he was right, yeah. nervous before the games, I gather, but he didn't always get a game, did he? Oh no, no, sometimes he had to, uh, he had to take a back seat and, and, and <laughs> watch from the sidelines and, and, and that's all part of, uh, of being a footballer. You know, it's uh, it ain't always roses as he, you know, he finds now. Now you're one of his, his biggest fans. You've always oh, sure. said that you think he's, he can do it at any level, yep. and, and he's proved that he can score he's, goals. That's at any right. Level. That's right. Yeah. I mean, uh, like I said, when, when he was in the even in the fourth division, and he was scoring goals regular, and people used to say the knockers in the game say, oh, but he won't score at an higher level and that. But when you've got the pace that he's, he's got, he, he, he'll score f for you know Wolves. England, whoever, you know. Do you remember any particularly spectacular goals that he scored in, in Sunday morning football? Well, it's, that's a difficult to, question to ask, really, Phil, because he, he basically he scored, um, on average, a goal a game for me. Yeah. So, um, the, the, only thing, the only one that, that springs to, to mind, I mean, um, it was a cup final when we played um, the four in hand, and we'd lost to them the week before in the cup final, yeah. when... I told Steve, this is when the Albion at first said that they wasn't going to give him uh, uh, the contract. And Blackpool were apparently... Well, Blackpool was, was, was on his trail, but I'd got a Stoke City scout 
come into the game. And I thought, well, I'll give Steve a bit of a boost and tell him, like, I've got somebody here to, you know, who's watching him. He had a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> we lost the cup. Yeah. So City Scout went away. The second week, we played him in a game, the same side, four in hand, the team who Brian Robson used to be associated with when yeah. he was at the Albion. And um, we beat him 3 1. Bully scored two cracking goals. And no, if he no, play, no, if no, played well the week before, he could have signed for Stoke. Yeah. But he, as it was, he went to, to Albion. As it, as it was, the Albion changed the minds, and uh, I think that's all a bit of sense in the end. And, um, well, rest re speaks for itself, then. I took him into the first Monday of the Christmas, after the Christmas, and uh, told Nobby Stiles, Nobby Stiles asked me about him. I told him he couldn't play for Toffee. Why did you say that? Well, he hadn't got much uh, control, you know. And uh, Nobby said, what's his good points? And uh, I said, well, he scores goals. And he said, that'll do for me. Well, the local scout recommended him from a, lad, a chap called Sid Day, and he's the local scout for West Brom. And he recommended this young striker at, uh, but he was 19 years of age, and we thought he was a little old, but with Sid Day's rec recommendation, we brought him in training, and he used to come in and train at the night time, and that was with the 14-year-olds, and Steve was 19. So it showed that I always had that sort of lot of character to come in and start training with the youngsters. And so then uh, we put him in the 18, for us, and he played in the 18. And every week he played in the 18 for me, he always scored one or two goals. But one of the big things was he, he missed goals. You know, he was always going to get chances in a game, 100% all the time. He, he used to wear defenders down. He'd never give him a minute. And I always thought, well, I was a defender. How would I have liked to play against him? And I, I thought that was the way I, I, I wouldn't. So anyway, he, he did well. He did quite well. And uh, I recommended to John Giles to sign him pro. And John said, well, we'll play him in the reserves for a few while, uh, for a few games. And he played in the reserves for a few games. But he didn't do much. And then I found out why, really. He, he hadn't been showing much in the reserves, but he was... Coming and training for me on a Thursday night, working the next, working on a shift the next night, uh, and I know that the work he was doing was very hard. I forget what it was, but it was hard work, and he was working till the early hours of Saturday morning. Coming to play for me on the Saturday morning, we might travel from eight o'clock or something over to Nottingham, play. I always scored one or two goals. Played in the afternoon for for Tipton, and played on the Sunday for the local side, and then on the Monday he was back in work on a shift, and on a Tuesday night he came to play for the reserves. He had no energy. So I said to John, well, I'd recommend a signing pro. And he says, well, do you think so? And I said, I think so. I would recommend signing pro. So he signed pro. And again, he started to score goals. He always scored goals. Despite impressive goal-scoring performances and occasional first-team appearances, Bull failed to persuade West Brom manager Ron Saunders of his merits. And Saunders subsequently transferred him to nearby struggling rivals, 4th Division Wolverhampton Wanderers. I think it was a very big disappointment for Stevie, yeah. He, to say it was anything less was because as I said he was a Tipton boy and he'd, you know, he'd been given the chance at West Brom and he, he used to love playing for them um, but I think uh, to be fair I think it was the right thing for him you know people said I'm sure, I'm sure West Brom would have now look back and say well wish we'd have kept him and we'd, you know, we'd have had this and we'd have had that but I think it was the right thing and I think Ron Saunders did the right thing for him because he wasn't really getting his chance there, and uh, he went away, and I think it gave him that much more belief in himself as well, and he was going to show everybody, which he has done. And I think, uh, it's, you know, I think Ron Saunders was right for that. Obviously, for a team like Wolves, being steeped in the tradition and the history that they've got, playing in the fourth division must have been uh, a di real disappointment. Well, it was, because when I first went there, I they played Chorley, Chorley away at Bolton Ground, and I thought, oh, what have I come to here? You know, I mean, they lost one 0 and I thought, oh, what have what have I come to here? You know, I mean, and then the next three games we lost three 0 on the trot. I thought, yes, yeah, definitely, what have I done? Yes, I think the, um, 
re-emergence of the club as a force in English football has gone hand in hand with, with Steve's achievement. Um, I think as a manager and as a coach you get a lot of satisfaction seeing a boy that you take from uh, second division club's reserves and watch him develop into an international player. Um, there's some hard work gone into the development of Steve. We've, we've worked hard with his finishing, his first touch, things like that, but uh, uh, we've got to recognise how much the boy's put into the game and how much he's improved himself. Um, and he's had a tremendous attitude to work. He's wanted to, to get better. He's wanted to prove people wrong at West Brom who were prepared to sell him. Uh, I think that's been one of the motivating forces behind his um, emergence. Uh, he's treated like a god now by, by the people on the South Bank and the John Island stand. Um, and he really has emerged as, uh, I would say, uh, the most professional player that I've ever worked with or played with in terms of his ability to do the job that he's paid to do. And that is obviously to score goals. And I've never come across anybody better at that job than, than, than Steve does it. That's towards Bull now, he's in with a chance. And he's found the back of the net. I was here when we signed Steve in November 86 and uh, the directors uh, put up the necessary cash to sign uh, Steve and Andy Thompson on the same day. That was a big risk at the time, wasn't it? Well, that's right. I mean, there wasn't a lot of money about. I mean, the club, right from since it started in 86, the new company has been completely self-financing. I mean, it doesn't have any arrangements for overdraft facilities. So all the money it generates through gate receipts, commercial income, etc., we have to plough back into the game uh, and use for buying players. Steve Bull proving to be one of Wolves' better buys. Oh, tremendous. I mean, Steve has now, well, I mean, his value, you can't estimate uh, really what his true value is, but uh, for £64,000, a uh, tremendous investment. To steal to the byline, the cross comes in. Wasn't far away. Dennison. Ball with a header. Steve Bull came to us from West Bromwich Albion through uh, the activity of our chief scout, Ron Dukes, who'd watched him and considered that uh, he would be a good player, at, uh, particularly as we were at that moment of time in the fourth division. So the co a colleague of mine and myself, we, we agreed at that time to uh, sign Steve Bull. Um, the terms seemed right, apart from the, the fact that we did a cross deal with West Brom, which gives them part of the profits, which is a... But still, that's the... I'm sure West Bromwich feel as, uh, as much sorrow about that as uh, we are, <coughs> in fact, over the moon about. Well, Ron Dukes, as Wolves' chief scout, you were well aware of the abilities of Steve Bull, and at the time that Wolves were struggling and not scoring any goals, uh, he seemed a, a likely target at West Bromwich Albion, is that right? Uh, yes, Steve was scoring goals in the in the Albion reserve side. Um, Albion reserves are uh, a side that uh, one, is, one frequently goes to watch, as does uh, as are all the other Midland reserve sides. Um, the Central League is a, is, a, is a reasonable recruiting ground, particularly when, when Wolves at that time were, were in the fourth division. Uh, and um, I, I felt that in the Albany Reserve side there were several players who, who uh, could move uh, and do well in the fourth or third divisions. One isn't able to say that they're going to go right the way through, as some of them have done ultimately. Um, and Ball was a lad who'd come to Albion from Tipton, um, had certainly improved in the 12 months uh, since I'd seen him play for Tipton, um, and uh, was, was consistently scoring goals and consistently uh, causing himself a nuisance to the defence because he was perpetually on the go. Uh, mobility and, uh, and, and enthusiasm were the hallmarks that one, one saw in him. Were you surprised then that uh, a young goal scorer like that was released by Ron Saunders? Um, well, I can't look into Ron Saunders' mind. I don't know what 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 he what his program was. He he got a number of strikers in the reserve side at that particular time, and people like Verardi and Cooks who were not getting regular games in the first team. Um, you can only play X number of players in your first team. You make your assessment, and he made the assessment that uh, 
although he'd given Bull a, a game or so in the in the in the first team and he, he had actually scored, um, it wasn't for him. Were you reluctant or, or cautious, perhaps, uh, the price that was quoted by West Bromwich Albion? Well, the price has nothing to do with me. The idea, uh, I think, somebody can play or somebody can't play, and it's for the manager and the board to decide uh, whether the price is uh, right too high or what. Um, with hindsight, everyone would say it's, it's not very much. At the time, fifty thousand was a was a big fee for Wolves, um, and uh, we, we subsequently went back and bought um, uh, two other players from Melbourne in, in in a very short space of time. In fact, we bought one the same day as um, uh, as Wall, um, Andy Thompson, and and both of them were very very speedy transfers. Andy, you perhaps better than anybody else at Molyneux know Steve Ball because you were with him at West Brom Albion. When he came to to West Brom as a raw non-league player, how did the the rest of the professionals at uh, at the Hawthorns view him? Um, well, first of all, he come on trial like to start with before he ever signed professional, and he was like um, doing well in the reserves, knocking a few goals in, and um, I think that's what got him the contract at the club. But he was um, doing well scoring in the reserves. Were you surprised that West Brom were prepared to, to let somebody who was scoring goals go and who had a potential and was young to, to another club? Um, I was very surprised. Like I was waiting in the offices at the Albion when Steve came in because they told me I was travelling down with somebody else for the morning. But I was very surprised to let him go because the amount of goals he had scored for the second team. And he scored, I think it was three and five games for the first team when he played then. So I was very surprised that they let him go. Now, what was the story around the two of you moving? Because it happened very, very quickly, didn't it? Uh, well, I just went in for training on the one morning, and like one of the trainers says to me, um, the manager wants to see you down the ground. So I travelled down to the ground. He says, um, Wolves come in for you. They made an offer, and we agreed. He didn't talk terms. And I was about to set off, and then they says, wait a minute, there's somebody else coming down there. <laughs> and and there's somebody else yeah, with Steve. Yeah, Steve coming to the office. And you developed a, a great friendship with him from that time, didn't you? Yeah, no, well, we travelled down together, like, because Steve had the car, and we travelled down, and he's just gone from there, because, like, we come together. And you came into a fourth division setup here, a uh, pretty poor ground after the Hawthorns, which is a, a beautiful setup. You must have uh, wondered whether you were making the right decision, perhaps? Um, it did get through my mind after I made the decision, like, because um, we just played Chorley, and we just lost 3 0 when I did sign, but from then we've done well, we've battled hard, and we've come up. Now, when you came, Steve went in first to see the manager, I believe, and he, Graham Turner, Turner says, was the fastest signing he's ever made until he signed you. Yeah, uh, well, he says um, whatever, it um, looks at a good setup, like, and he says, like, the building for the future and that. So we went in and like, talked to the manager, and what he offered us, uh, we liked, so we signed. Steve, in his period with us, has been the makings of the club, really. If one takes into account his goals, that's the reason we won the, f the fourth division, the reason we won the third division. He's a tremendous character. I've dealt with him and his contracts over the last two years. He's uh, been in to see me on both occasions, particularly recently on his trip back from Italy. But it's been a pleasure to do with uh, the chap. I mean, the two interviews to, to uh, fix his salary have taken 15 minutes at the most. Uh, we've had no cause to disagree, and uh, anything he's asked for, not we've given him, but we've edged a little bit each way, and he's, he said, yes, I never want to leave this club. And I take the view that if he never wants to leave this club, he won't leave this club. <laughs> There's a peculiar tradition here at Wolves which involves all the players training on the club's car park. What's the history behind this? Yes, this is uh, a tradition. The manager started a, a few uh, seasons ago um, where they used to have a little five-a-side on the car parks. And I think the following day when we played the game, we had a tremendous result. And they've done it ever since. And the players seem to enjoy it. They have a little bit of... Uh, uh, a competition, there's a yellow jersey which uh, is awarded to the worst performance of the morning on the car park and that causes a little interest between the players and I think it, it gives a good spirit for the players prior to, to the game on a Saturday and they seem to really enjoy it. Has Steve ever been awarded the yellow jersey? Well, I believe he's had it once or twice without, without doubt. Um, uh, there have been mornings when he's looked abysmal and 
Uh, he's tried his hand at playing at the back at times, and uh, uh, but yes, he's, he's he's had things like that. His toughness is is built round wanting to score goals. It's as simple as that. I don't think he's a dirty player, um, but when he gets a sight of goal and the ball is around about him, uh, nothing stands in his way, or he doesn't want anything to stand in his way, and uh, he's prepared to knock defenders uh, sideways if necessary to get a strike at goal. And I think that is. Um, fuel that sort of image of uh, a bull type player um, but I think that he's also taken a lot of stick from defenders and at times intimidation and unfortunately on two or three occasions he's reacted to that intimidation um, but I think that having been sent off a couple of times uh, he's learned from that and I see it now keeping a cool ahead uh, prepare to take the intimidation and the hard tackling and get up and get on with it and it would be fair to say he certainly gives as good as he gets out there Early on in my career, I was very, very, very raw. You know, I mean, I'd snap at anything, I'd have a swing, I'd have a kick, I'd, have, you know, I mean, I'd do anything to stop the defenders from pulling me. But now I think to myself, I'd just turn around and I'd look at them and I'd laugh at them. And I'd put the ball in the back of the net and that, that hurts them more. And uh, it's far more pleasurable for you than getting a yellow yeah, card. Yeah, I'm isn't punching it? some weird laughing yeah. and saying, oh, God, I've sent off again, like, you know what I mean? Mm. How much do you have to concentrate during a game? How, how often can you have a lapse of concentration or can't you? Well, you have to, you have to put your shirt on and that's it. Forget everything, the radio's off, everything, nobody's talking to you, whatever, you just had to go on that pitch for 90 minutes and concentrate all on the game. Forget the fans, forget the television, forget everything. In fact, the only person in the upper tier of the Waterloo Road stand is the Wolves manager, Graham Turner. And that drops the ball, fires one, 1-0! One <laughs> oh, he'll be delighted, that's put Wolves ahead. Turn from Denison. That's a beautiful ball in for much lasered up for ball. 4 0. Leicester full back. That's a great ball through. Steele now. Ball in again. Can he get his hat trick? He can. 3 0. Three goals for ball. 5 0 to Wolves. Taylor allowed space to chest it down. It wasn't good, a good layoff from him, but uh, certainly allowed a little too much space. And Dennis neatly through for Bellamy. Wolves away on this left side now. Through with a run on goal, fires it, 2-0. Oh, you can't allow that sort of space to Steve Ball. His finishing is absolutely lethal, and you really cannot afford to let him get that sort of space behind the defence. Now Steele, it's a good cross to the far post, Ball's there, 3-0. Ball will chase after this, gets there ahead of Rennie, gets away from him. Players one in, straight through the keeper's legs. Oh, poor Ronnie Sinclair. Would you believe it? Well, you have to feel sorry for Ronnie Sinclair there in the City goal. Obviously, being the goal scorer that you are, you attract a lot of attention, press attention as well. Do you buy every single newspaper available and sit and read them? I usually buy them, but uh, as I say, the girlfriend don't like the press. Well, I don't like the press, actually, but uh, as I say, we buy the papers just to see whether they've been to the match or not. But uh, some reports... They're not even at our game, I don't think so. Do you sometimes read them and think, well, he must have been at a different game to me? Because... Well, it is. It's, a, it's, it's not in your case, but uh, in my case, playing football, you read the boat, you think, oh, it's, it's a lot of rubbish sometimes. Does that affect you at all, though, if you get up and you think you've had a game and somebody says, oh, Steve Ball was rubbish yesterday? Well, it does. They say, oh, I wake up and I think, oh, I, I, had a, I had a decent game, I worked hard, I never scored, but I worked hard. And they say the papers, all booted out, should be out and all this, but uh, as you say, some of them don't even go to the games, I don't think so. Well, Paul Stancliffe, obviously you've seen Bully at close hands from both ends of the pitch because you've been a defender against him for Sheffield United and now a teammate of his at uh, Wolves. What is it, from a defender's point of view, that makes him such a difficult player to handle? I think his, his ability really just to, to unsettle defenders. He's not frightened of running at them or running past them. He'll always shoot, he's not frightened of missing. And you, you look through the, the years and that's always been a, sort of a great goal scorer's attribute. He seems like a, a very physical player. Does he knock defenders around? He does, yeah, but I, I always enjoyed playing against him because he was always an honest lad. He wasn't sort of a give you an elbow on the sly or kick you on the sly. You know, it, whatever he did was truly honest and he, he was sort of centre forward he enjoyed playing against. Now, as a, a man who played for his local sides in Rotherham and, and Sheffield, you understand the, uh, the fans having a certain uh, empathy with him because of him being a local lad here in Wolverhampton. Oh, definitely. I mean, he's done, he's done tremendously well. He gives the lads uh, on the cup something to cheer about. You know, they can sort of relate to somebody like that because, like I say, he's come up as a local lad. 
you know, there's probably a few on there that went to school with him. They, they know him, known him years, so they always like somebody to cheer on like that. Bishop is released. Much. He fires it through the ball. Truly, 2 0. Well, that's a disaster by Ian Bishop. Absolute suicide. Steve, I think it's fair to say that uh, certainly at Walsh, you're what might be classed as a local hero, aren't you? The fans there certainly have taken to you. Well, the fans love him because, uh, as you say, I score goals and uh, they enjoy coming down and playing every week and just, just seeing goals and seeing we win. We've got ambitions and I think that's one of the reasons why the loyalty of Steve has been um, uh, quite outstanding. He's always been prepared to uh, commit his future to, to the club and I believe it's because both he and the club have shared the same ambitions and that is to become, in his case, a, a first division player and in the club's case, a, a force in the first division. Um, it's been proved that you don't have to be in there to get international recognition, uh, but the sooner we get there, the better, and I certainly feel that uh, seasons in the first division will yet again improve, Steve. Header away from Andy Ritchie, neatly brought down by Cook and volleys it up in one motion, ball. Surely, 1-0! Positively, and really should have gone one nil ahead from Andy Much just a moment earlier. And the Wolves are really enjoying themselves this afternoon. Ball is in two one. Well, Nicky Clark. Is I think one of the big things about Steve is his honesty, and I think it shows to people. It shows his guts and his character. You know, as I say, people used to always kept going on about his first touch and his this and that. And nobody plays at international level as he's played and coming through the divisions and keeps scoring the goals like he does uh, if you're, you're not a good player. He's a very good player, and as I said, and they're, they're the things. And I think, you know, his, his name probably typifies it, but they like that Bulldog sport. And when England against the wall or whatever, that's when they come out with the supporters coming back in him. And I think they identify with Stevie. He's always. He's always gonna he's always gonna be there. He's always gonna be working hard for you, he's always gonna be there. And if there's half a chance, more often than not, Stevie will hit the net. Well here we are, Albert, uh, just before Wolves fans set off for yet another away trip. And to see their hero in action, hopefully uh, scoring goals at Ashton Gate. Bully is an absolute hero to the to the Wolves fans and has really almost single-handedly helped to rebuild this club, hasn't it? Oh, without a doubt, without a doubt. I think we were sceptics in the early days and you had people in my ilk saying, well, he, he's not as good as the old school, but, I mean, in fairness, we got a bow to the lad. He's put Wolverhampton back on the map, the team. Everything so far, uh, you can't praise the lad enough. He's done wonders for the club and he's most certainly the hero of the day. The Wolves fans love him as a, as a, almost as a god, really, and it's something that you can actually uh, build on. You can use the, the Steve Bull image uh, to, to carry along uh, projects for the, for the supporters, and I think particularly of the trip to Newcastle. Well, that was a wonderful event. I mean, it was very, very, very difficult at the time, but uh, Steve, as though somebody waved a magic wand both in both directions, I think he took something out of the crowd that day, and we certainly took something out of Steve. And uh, as you say, it was script written, really. It was a mag magnificent day, and, and he couldn't have done more. And it was down to a sole man in that particular instant to, to put four goals away. It was incredible. But what a boy, what, what a player and a legend in his own right now, and, and, and rightly so.
when you go out there and play 90 minutes and you don't score a goal, do you think necessarily then you've had a bad game or not? Well, um, I'm usually a bit moody after the game if I haven't scored, like, but uh, not otherwise. I say as long as the team wins and they say the bonus in the pay, wage packet, that's all that matters. <laughs> Uh, what, how does scoring goals affect uh, life outside? If you're moody for half an hour after a game, does that spill over into Saturday night? And well, not really. As I say, I've, I have uh, two hours coming back on the couch if we're away match and we lose. I sit there and then I come back and she she, she smiles at me and goes, are you all right? okay, all right, you all right, or whatever. And I say, yeah, it's all right now, it's all gone now. But uh, after I come back in the house, it's usually gone. What are those long coach trips like from away games when you come back, depending on whether you've won or lost? We have a game cards and relax and have a, have a drink on the way back and it's relaxing, really. If you've had a bad game or the team's lost, you sit there and take the game apart and, and say it was your fault for letting that one in. <laughs> well, we do, but we don't blame each other. We, we, we look over our mistakes and think, oh, we should have done that, we should have done this. But uh, we never blame each other. It's a team, it's a team game. On the side of b being a team game, being a scorer up front, how important is it for you, for the players around you to be playing well? Well, they've got to, aren't they? Because uh, on, the, on the goal getter, the same as Andy Much now, um, but uh, that we have got to have the ball, the supply of the balls to put the ball in it. But uh, it's, it's on our own backs as well to do a lot of contribution to the other team as well to get there. Andy, they say that all good striking uh, partnerships are pairs, and very much it's a, a case of Steve Bull and Andy Much that have worked together to bring Walls from the fourth division into the second division. Did you ever have any inkling when you first made that partnership how successful it would be? Not really, no. I think at the, at, at the time, you know, we just got thrown together, you know, and uh, Steve came from West Brom, you know, he wasn't really very re recognised then, and uh, since he's been at the club, you know, we've worked hard together, and uh, we have formed a, a reasonably good partnership together, really, and... Uh, I think obviously Steve's uh, in the forefront, obviously being at the international level, but I think we do have a good partnership together, but obviously at the time we didn't really foresee that. You've, you've had to work together, I mean, in times when you've been injured and he's not played so well, people do feel that you do contribute quite a lot to, to his game, but what's he like to play alongside? Well, he's very easy to play up front with, to be quite honest, because he's very hard working and honest, you know. You know, if there's a ball played down the line, he'll be the first to run to it, you know, and vice versa. We both work hard for each other. We, uh, we talk a lot together, you know, before we go out, you know, and we conscientiously want to do well for each other and, you know, try and create goals for each other. And I think if you've got that, you're halfway there, you know. He does score an incredible number of goals for the games he's played. What do you put that down to? Well, he's very strong and determined. Like, you know, every game he plays, you know, he wants to score goals. He's, he's very hungry to score goals. And, and obviously he's got a very good strike and he's got great pace and, uh, and strength. And if there's a, you know, sometimes a 60-40 ball, you know, he's always strong enough to get there. He's had criticism from people who say that his first touch isn't good and that uh, he'll never play well at the very top level. But you've played very close to him. Do you think he's got the ability to do it at any level? Oh, without a shadow of a doubt, you know. I mean, if Steve played for a top first division club tomorrow, I'd have a, he'd be a top, amongst the top first division scorers. There'd be no doubt in my mind that that would be the case, you know. But they've mentioned about his first touch a few years ago, but that tends to stick a bit. I think what happens is uh, they said he didn't have a good touch, which he may not have when he first came to the club, but he's, been, he's improving all the time, you know, as a player. And I don't think he'd be in the international, international squad if he couldn't control the ball. Simple as that. Having the afternoon spree, um, what do you actually get up to? There's this traditional picture we have of footballer playing golf or fishing. Well, at the moment, as I say, there's, there's not a lot I can do. As I say, I'm, I'm either doing presentations, signing autographs, doing things like this. But uh, I like again golf and a, a, a swim now and again. It's nice and relaxing. What about the golf? How good is it or bad? Bad. It is <laughs> terrible. Yeah, I'll, just, I'll just line the balls up and just whack them and just let them go anywhere they want. Is that relaxing though as well? Does that is that one point where you can forget about the football? It is because you're out there, you know, you know, on a three mile course and nobody can bother you, just hit the balls and just have a bit of fresh air and just get out there and take no notice of anybody. And I suppose it's exercise that doesn't involve running around a football pitch. Well it, well um, I'm usually running, I'm running after my ball. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the other golfers aren't. But uh, it is it is relaxing. On the fitness front, being a, a striker, that has obviously got to be one of the positions where if you are slightly unfit people are gonna notice. Well, they do, they do, because you've got to run there, there, run backwards, forwards, all of those. Uh, I usually try to keep myself fit. I say it's only some of the injuries and the knocks that knock you back a bit, but uh, otherwise I'm, I'm quite fit. Well, how do you go about the fitness? Do you do fitness outside of the club? or? Well, we've got exercise bike upstairs. I usually, right. usually get on that now and again, but uh, don't do all that much. Don't do all that much. 
What about fitness related to eating? Do you have to be careful what you eat or not? No, I'll just eat what I want. Eat and drink what I want and eat. I'll just get off the next morning. It's quite envious. What's your favourite dishes then? Are you? Favourite dishes? Oh, yeah. Double cheeseburgers and chips, I think, from McDonald's. <laughs> it's, it's stuff like that. I always do a lot of junk food and a lot of sweets. I don't, it's a wonder I don't put loads of weight on, but it just suddenly comes off. Mm. They ever say at the club, oh, three burgers too many <laughs> this week? Or? No, they, they don't know what to eat. They only know what we have for pre-match and I have noise. Steak, egg and beans, something like that, pretty much, or cheese omelette. Is that still the traditional pre-match meal, a steak, is that? That, that is a pre-match meal. Well, well, all I have now is cheese omelette, beans and toast and a nice cup of tea. And mm. I'm, I'm ready, for, ready to go then. What time do you usually get to the ground before a Saturday game? We usually get there about quarter to ten to two. Have a sit down and say, read the, read the programme, look, look at the pitch, and then uh, get back and get, get ready. What about a midweek game, depending on whether you're home or away? Midweek game, I say, oh, we train in the morning, have a little circle and a few sprints. I come back and I say, I have a, a bit of soup or something for dinner, and then I have, I have my steak, egg and, egg and beans, and then I'm off there. Yeah. What about away games midweek? Are they tiring? Because it's obviously, <laughs> depending on the distance, uh, you could be travelling for three or four hours before you get there. Yeah, that, they are tired, and so it takes a lot out of you. That's why, you, if you're a good uh, say manager and trainer, they get you there early enough so you can have a rest or sleep in the afternoon so you can relax and then get up and then ready, refreshing for the game. Right, but then again come quarter to ten and you've got to sit back on the road. Well that's it, you're there again, oh here we go again, like, I mean, but as long as it's over you don't mind, it's just travelling there and getting the game over with and then when on the way back you just you just relax and that's it, then it's gone. What about the next day, do they give you some time off? They, they, we usually have a, a day off a week, so the manager's generous to us, I think you know, we have a, a Wednesday off after a midweek game or even if we haven't got a midweek game. We run hard on the Tuesday, have a good blow, like clear the lungs, and then we have Wednesday off. What makes a good referee? Do, do referees come in and have a good lengthy chat with you before the game? Or? Not really. They check the studs, check your rings, check your necklaces, whatever, and all that. And uh, they just say, no swearing, ten yards away from the ball, and I'll just let the play go on. But isn't that a kind of set menu that they're going to say to every team before every game? Would it be any easier if referees came in and had a chat? Or? Well, it would. Well, if, if they did that, I think they'd get accused of getting too, you know, getting too close to the players and allowing, you know, allowing them to carry on with it. Dirty fouls and stuff like that. But uh, I think the referees should just keep well away from the players and just do their job and read it. But isn't that one of the problems that the referees are being accused of not understanding the players? Well, it is, but uh, they're referees, we're players. Uh, ours is a totally different game to going out there and playing, and theirs is totally different to going out there and doing uh, judgments on us. Referees and players, one side. Uh, obviously, it's a long way off, but uh, could you ever see yourself as Steve Ball, the manager? <laughs> I don't think so. I don't think I'm uh, strong enough and hard enough for the manager's job. I don't think I'd like to go into something like coaching or something, or even they say something else outside football. Mm. TV commentator. <laughs> not the way I talk. No, not the way I talk. No. <laughs> well, what about uh, management, though? Is it uh, is it something that looks simpler than it is? Or it looks easy. Yeah, but there's a there's a lot of uh, stress and hard working behind that. You know, what I mean, behind a happy face. Mm. You often see a lot of unhappy faces in football management. Quite a few. Quite a few. Say we we usually get the backlash quite a couple of times. What happens if the, the game's just gone really badly and you've lost 3-0? Um, do you just have to sit there and think, oh, well, it's going to come, so I've got to take it? And well, that's it. Say, you know whether you've had a bad game. You know, you know. I'd, I'd want the manager to pull me in and say, look, you, you've, you've had a bad game. You, you want to improve on this, improve on that. But uh, they've got to keep the distance as well, and they know how to, how, to, how to plan the game out. Well, I think the pleasing thing about his um, rise to international football is that the lad himself has never changed. His attitude to work, his attitude to his teammates and in the dressing room has never changed one little bit. And um, uh, I think that's, that's, that's very pleasing. He still gets the same sort of rollicking that, uh, that other players will get from time to time. Um, the other players take the mickey out of him just as much as he takes the mickey out of uh, his teammates. So it's been, it's been good for the dressing room that the star of the side has never been treated any differently and never wanted to be treated any differently. Um, and I think that helps in team spirit, in morale in the dressing room. Uh, and they obviously see his contribution to the team and, and they share in the success that he's had. I can recall his, his, uh, his run on the pitch at, against the Scots. 
and I frankly felt a lump in my throat. I thought, felt I was part of it, and uh, I was proud to be that way. And on comes Steve Ball for his first cap. And he's only the fifth player to appear from the third division. I mean, his very first international, I think it was his first international against Scotland. I mean, three shots and the keepers had to, the keepers had to make two saves and, and he scored a one. Um, that's the way he always is. But a great strength about him is if he misses a chance, it, it doesn't get him down. And that takes some doing. Ten minutes remaining. Ball. And again! Oh. In the corner, what a start. Scoring on his debut. The man from the third division and Wolves, although they're about to leave there, scores on his first appearance at senior level. Eye for goal again. No hesitation, bang. The cross in here, and as he goes up with McPherson, look, it hits his back, and he's already turning because he knows where it's going to drop, and he finishes superbly and uh, really instinctive. Speaking on behalf of the fans, there is this pent up feeling inside. Steve, we love you, we want you to stay, but uh, we hope sincerely that it doesn't now affect his England. And I think in the back of his mind, his England place, he's thought, well, if Wolves sort of totter now at the back end of this season, where's it going to put him? And we sincerely hope and believe that uh, the fact that he's staying loyal to Wolves will not affect his chances with the England squad. He's already Wolves' second highest goal scorer behind John Richards and he's made inroads into the England side. Can he score those sort of goals at international level, which is a, a different type of football? There again, I haven't got a crystal ball, I can't answer that. One can only say that if he's given the opportunity, he'll prove whether he can or whether he can't. And do you think he will get that opportunity? Because the problem is that the style of his play is not that sophisticated, is it? Um, when it comes to sophistication and so on and so forth, the only thing that wins matches is the ball in the back of the net. Now, if someone decides that they're going to give him the opportunity to see whether he can do it, he'll take that opportunity and do it, or he'll take an opportunity and fail. And that's what he's done all the way along the line. Up to now, it's been one long string of success. I don't think he's had entirely a fair, uh, a fair crack of the whip in his uh, service to England. He hasn't, to me, he doesn't seem to have had the right sort of service. Um, OK, uh, uh, Taylor picks the England team and he, I, think, I, I still think he'll stay with Bully and I, I frankly think that he, is, he can still do a, a, a good job for England. We've had a change of manager during the, uh, his brief career in international football. Uh, I believe that Graham Taylor thinks quite highly of him, regards him um, as, a, as a good member of the squad. Uh, it's up to Steve if he can get an opportunity again to make sure that he takes it. I believe that the criticism of him has been very unfair and the pressure heaped upon him before the Poland match um, was almost unbearable. Uh, he was the golden boy during the summer just prior to the... To the um, to the World Cup, everybody was championing his course to become a, a regular in the England side. Um, but unfortunately, having got there, then the press uh, and the media in general just just turned against him. And he's uh, when you get people like Sir Ralph Ramsey being very critical and feeling that he shouldn't be a member of the England team, then I think sooner or later it's got to got to affect the boy. And I watched the game against Poland very closely, and I felt that he didn't do himself justice in the game. Uh, he looked a little bit uptight. Uh, which is to be expected with the amount of pressure that had been heaped upon him. Um, but I believe that he will emerge as, uh, as a very good first division player with this club um, and further stake his claims for a place in the England side, a permanent place in the England side. People talked about the partnership with Gary Lineker not being a successful partnership. Um, one wonders how long Gary will go on playing for England, uh, although he's doing an excellent job at the moment and I wouldn't dispute that. Uh, I feel Steve has got the, um, the potential, the ability to ultimately replace Gary Lineker in the England team.
How tired and weary are you at an end of a season, and then when you know you've got to go off to, to the World Cup, does it does it actually revitalise you at all, or do you feel even more tired? No, well, in a, in a sense, it, it gives you a buzz inside your inside your body, as though you got a feeling as though you're going to the World Cup. But at the end of the season, your legs are tired, your head's tired, and you just want to get back home. You know, I mean, have a couple of weeks off and eat and drink as much as you can. But uh, I never had the chance this summer, so I went to Italy and uh, it went okay. What was Italy like? How did you find the locals out there? It was all right. I say, you, as you say, you see in the papers a bit these discos we went to and everything, but there was no life there at all. As I say, we could never go out, never do anything. It was just we was there for a job, and that was it. Was that a shame at all? Because if I'd been spending four weeks in a foreign country, I would have thought, well, I've got to see a few of the sights. Well, you could have been, you could have done, but uh, we got out now and again. We had a game of golf, stuff like that, swim, you know what I mean, and sunbathe, but uh, we was more or less restricted to the hotel p p perimeter. What kind of food did they give you out there? Did you sample the traditional stuff, or was it... It was just you... everything they put down for you. You know what I mean? You could eat what you want, but on the day, match of the day or the day before the match, they set a meal out for you, but before that, you could eat and drink as much as you want. What about the weather? How was it? It looked good from here. It was too hot. Too yeah. hot. They say we've got a nice tan out there, but they say we were climatised to the weather as well. And we was, we was quite fit in that conditions. World Cup itself, um, I think it's fair to say. Certainly, the final was a great disappointment to, to most people that watched it. Uh, there was a lot of playing up to the cameras out there. How how were you out there? What did you hear from back home when you were out there? Well, I, I didn't hear much. I say all 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 I was in say all the people are cheering for you and everything, helping Linda well and all that, but. Uh, as far as the team went, I think the team went extremely well. They say we was unlucky. If we'd have had a bit more luck, and uh, you know, we scored another goal against Germany, we'd have got to the final. I think we'd have won the final. Mm -hmm. But uh, the final itself, as you say, disappointing. Argentina, disappointing team. But uh, never mind. It might be the next two years. Ball trying to get round him. Foster slips. Now he's got a chance to go past him. Not balls of greatest strength, but he fires one. And what a great goal! Well, that's just a measure of the man. He looked to have no opportunity, found the space around Steve Foster, and as he was falling, Bull fired the shot in. Playing for Wolves, coming up through the fourth, and then the third, and the second, now in the second division, um, it, it, it hasn't looked that difficult from an outsider's point of view. It looks as though you know the team's played well, and, and that's been you know the end of it. Well, it does, but uh, this is this is uh, the season we've started off the best out of the four of them, and uh, we usually sl start slow and then pick up towards the end where we uh, where we don't even get nowhere. But uh, we've we're starting well this season. I touch wood, I hope we can get out, out the second division this year. How important is it for you personally to play first division football? Well, I think I've had four four divisions, four seasons with the uh, Wolves now, and uh, I'm due one season in the first division at least. So I just hope it's next season. Let's hope it's more than one as well. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope so. I say once they're up there, I'm going to try and, keep, try and keep them up there. Cook curls it through, balls there, fires it first time and finds the back of the net. 
looked up, looked at the goal, picked his spot, didn't bother controlling it, just hit it in the back of the net. It's that simple. You come across as a very kind of ordinary chap. No great airs or graces. How do people outside to see you? Do you have still friends from, say, 10 years ago, 15 years ago that you meet up with and they say, oh, I can't talk to you now, you're a famous footballer? Well, they do. They, I do meet up with them now and again as, I, as much as I can. But uh, when I meet up with them, they're still the same. They, they still respect me as the same, same person, the same player. Do they talk to you differently at all? No, they're still the same. They still say, do you want a point? <laughs> that's about all <laughs> I say. Is that a good starting point? They're embarrassed to say anything or you know, they don't want to come and speak to me, but they're, all, they're okay. Do you find that people, if they come and talk to you, only want to talk about football or think that you only want to talk about football? Well, they do. As I say, when, when I go out for a presentation, whatever, I want to shut off. But if we're friends, you know, you, you've got to keep talking and talking and talking over the same things again. Where I've said it you know, to you, you're locked in and on and on and on. But you, you, have to, you have to talk about it and they're your friends, so you have to keep in with them. Do you ever try and change the conversation a bit and bring in something that you want to talk about? If I try something to. You could, you've seen on telly last night, or I try to, as I say, but uh, as I say, they just over overall it. You know, what I mean, they go back straight onto football again, but uh, you can't do anything about it. Dennison with the corner, flick on by Thompson. Ball, Stevie Ball's done it. Outside of football, um, you got two dogs here at the house. They're quite a handful, aren't they? Two tethers. Yeah. Yeah. No, they're good dogs, they say, they keep the girlfriend company, me and myself company, but they're, they're good lads, they say, they, they break us up really, they say, we, we take them for walks over the mountain now and have a good, they say, it keeps me fit as well. They look pretty vicious chaps, I mean, one of, what, the bigger one is apparently the friendlier one, yeah? Yeah, King, King and Sam, like, uh, King's the big one and uh, he's the one that usually looks after Sam, but Sam's bossing him about now, but uh, they are they are a handful. But Sam's not, not very old and already <laughs> looks as though yeah. she's going to... Well, he's going to be he's going to be a giant. He's, say, he's 14 weeks old now, but uh, they're not ferocious at the moment. They say if I go to eat the girlfriend or whatever, they'll they'll go for me. You know what I mean? They'll have me straight over, no trouble. What about taking him out for exercise? Is that full time occupation? It's, it's like that, you know. I mean, two two dogs and two leads. It, your arms are out and everything. You come back, your arms are bigger than you what they should be. But that all right. Good company as well for your girlfriend. Very good. I say I, I go on the England trips and I go on you know I mean the Wolves trips and everything. And uh, as I say, she's, she's got somebody to shout at. <laughs> well, she shout at you when you're home then? Or well, a few times. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, obviously going, being away a lot of the time with Wolves and England, um, does that make you appreciate being home even more? Well, it does. It, it, it makes me appreciate how much you need a girlfriend and how much you need somebody to come home to. They say you come into an empty house, it's, it's, it's not nice. They say now you've got a girlfriend in this, it's, it's great. But then again, I bet she has to be on the receiving end of all the... Uh, Swearing and the bad language <laughs> when you're getting after losing. Or? She does actually say, I'll come back and she, she looks at me and say, Go on then, have you, have you say, like whatever, <laughs> stuff like that. And we, we just get it over with. What happens Saturday nights when you're at home? What time do you get away from the club? Uh, I'll get away from the club about six o'clock, half past six, and I'll get in here about quarter to seven, something like that. I'll fetch uh, the Argus and the Sporting Star, read the papers, and say, We get a video in and usually have a, a, a bottle of wine out again. Mm. Do you go out a lot on Saturday nights? Or Not you... all that much. We, we, we can't, you say, we, we've got no privacy at, at all. We can't just go out to the local and say, Hello, you know, I mean, have, a, have a couple of points or whatever. We can't do that. They say it's invaded our privacy altogether. Does that bother you? Or? It, it doesn't bother me so much, you say, it's a girlfriend, they say, when we're out there together, when you're eating a meal or whatever, you go for a meal and somebody goes, can you sign this for me, show it up your nose, whatever, you know, anything. can't you just leave us alone, just to have a meal or something, be quiet. But at the end of the day, I suppose it's part and parcel of well, that's, being that's, a football. Well, that's it, that's, as you say, as you say it's, it's a price of fame. Right. But it's quite nice, therefore, I suppose, staying in is probably more pleasurable than going out to, well, to a pub actually, or to a pub. It is actually, you shut the curtain, shut yeah. the doors, lock everybody out, you know, you put the telly on and have a nice talk and a chat and sit down in front of the fire. And then wait for the Sunday papers. That's it, yeah. <laughs> See what they've put in. <laughs> what about videos? You think video? Well, I've, I've got about 54 in the, in the, in the cupboard. I, the, I like, the films I like, I can watch it over and over again. I like to, like to buy them. I say films, videos, everything. I, I just like them. What kind of films do you like? Then? Thrillers, I think. I like a thriller. But, uh, they're front the girlfriend tell so we can't have them in the house. <laughs> <laughs> well, what other stuff on, on the telly do you like watching? Can you watch a football game now without just seeing it as, as, as a tactical? Well, I, I don't like watching like the big match, the old coverage of it. I like the highlights, you know, I mean, the highlights, it's just, as you say, the same as cricket and golf. I like the highlights to show the good parts and not the bad parts. 
But do you ever sit there watching a game live, for example, and saying, no, 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 that's yeah. not the way to do it? Well, I'm always on the edge of the air, my feet and feet again. I'm like, you know me, I'm saying, oh, 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 I could have done that, oh, I could have done that. Who do you actually admire then, first division wise? As a player? Yeah. As a player, I've, I've always admired Ian Rush. Ian Rush, I've always, you know, I mean, looked at him and I think to myself, oh, I'm clinically the same player as he is. So what makes him a better striker than, than other strikers? What has he got? Is it intuition or is it? Goals. Yeah, when the ball is in it, say the the other strikers. I mean, they have off weeks and on weeks where he he keeps plugging away and getting goals. Cook takes it over, gets inside, good ball in, ball. He scored. It's about his second touch, and Stevie Ball finish starts this season when he finished last. Phil Evans having to battle there, and Timmy Steele as well. That's a good cross, and Ball is in there for his second. <laughs> Harris wins, but only as far as Denison to Ball. Is he on for the hat trick? He certainly is. Here we are in the games room with a feral collection of silverware over there, Steve. Yeah, they say there's a, quite a few trophies up there, and they say the golden boots and uh, a couple of sign balls as well. They say it's, that all all things I've won all gathered up uh, over the World Cup in the future. And I think the display is down to you, isn't it, Julie? Yeah, it's left all up to me. Very <laughs> tastefully done, though. Especially the cleaning as well. <laughs> It's a collection of caps, there's a golden boots down there, but also I see, along with the signed hat-trick balls, uh, a pair of goalkeeping gloves. I didn't know you were thinking of changing position. No, I was, was going to try about it, think about it, but uh, I got no chance for that. But uh, I asked uh, Peter Shilton at the World Cup, and he, he signed them. They are the pair that he, he wore at the World Cup, so it's a good souvenir. Yeah. Lots of other souvenirs in the World Cup. There's uh, one of your England shirts over there, which is signed by all the team. Yeah, I just picked a, a shirt out of random there and got everybody to sign it. Just things to look back on, you know, in good memories. And uh, loads of other pictures of Wolves games, England games. Uh, some of them photos, and there's actually uh, a, a painting over there. Yeah, there's a, a painting there, leader of the pack, and uh, that's a limited edition uh, that people can buy, a mail order. But uh, all the rest are just uh, picked from random and uh, put in frames. And the best bit's got to be this corner. Well, it is when they're on, uh, say, the, the, the six week holiday, when, uh, when other, everybody else is working. It'd be nice in here for us to just sit down and have a nice quiet drink. Yeah. Are you going to be banned from this room, Julie? I think I already have. <laughs> <laughs> it's a men's room, <laughs> <laughs> Have a few of the lads around for a beer and a game of pool. Well, a couple of them say, you know, I mean, when, when we have our days off or when things like that, when we can relax, that's, uh, it'd be nice to do it in here. What is it, do you think, that makes him such an incredible goal scorer? Well, goal scorers are born. They, you, you neglect them at the bell. People tell you that so-and-so can't play and so-and-so can't play. They can't do this and they can't do that. But they put the ball in the back of the net. I learned a long time ago that if they scored it off the back of the head or the back of the back of the arm, uh, they scored goals. You respect them. Um, Steve had got a, a single mindedness. He wanted to score and would chase anything to score. And that has stayed with him. Uh, other people have, have, have been short term wonders and got goals and then died away. He hasn't. Uh, he's just got on and on. Thompson inside for Ball, find space for the shot, and it's there! Well, Ball, only his second touch, really. Thompson's throw, Ball getting highest, much. Ball in the back of the net! Now Denison in, Shirley, hits it straight into Brian Horn. Horn rushing around, Shirley into the back of the net, it goes from Ball. Cook, and much with a little bit of space, whipped it across the goal, and Ball's out. Cook on the edge of the area, flicks it up, neatly finds Ball. Here on the back of the Cook looking for Bull again, gets the header in over Basie, it's there! Thompson whips it in towards the back post, Bull there, and gets his second, would you believe it? Thompson, an excellent cross. I, I believe that uh, Steve Ball will stay at Wolves for the whole of his career. I certainly hope he will. Um, obviously, the temptations will come his way to move on, but I firmly believe that uh, Steve's roots are obviously in the black country. Uh, he's certainly happy playing for Wolves at the moment. Hopefully, Wolves will give him first division football in the not too distant future, and, and I can't see any reason why he should want to leave us. But as, as I say, he's a one-off, and 
the biggest thing is if he keeps, he'll always be scoring goals. So if you keep looking at the records, he's always going to be there. I'm his greatest fan, there's no doubt about that. The ball through now with a chance. Can he slot it home? Yes, he can. Well, he's had plenty of opportunities tonight. And he's spurned all those that have previously come his way. Ball racing in, picked his spot and slotted it home with consummate ease to put Wolves 1-0 ahead. And if he went from Wolverhampton, I think, well, no, the club wouldn't close down. You know, the, the game is greater than the individual, but we admire him so much that, you know, he has to stay with us. Did I say it loud enough for him? Okay, fine. Okay,